and we are the proud caretakers of the Occult Society, uh, formerly known for many years as the Occult Bookstore in Chicago. How many years was it known as the Occult Bookstore? Decades and decades, yeah. yes. Uh, we celebrated our centennial uh, like this past December. So not this December, but uh, 2019. Yeah. And um, how did you get here to be the owners of the Occult Society? Oh my gosh. Um, I worked for Russell. I started working for Russell when I was about 16. That's a previous, um, uh, previous owner. Previous owner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came in the store as a young whippersnapper and used to sit on the floor and read books and not really buy books, <laughs> which I don't recommend. But, uh, and he was like, well, you know what? You're sitting here sucking up space on my floor. You should push a broom around or something, do something. And I was like, okay. And I got Jennifer and Russell to hire me on. And it was probably my second job of my entire life. And I continued to work here, even when I became normally employed. Um, and this store has been amazing to me in so many ways. It, is, it has changed my life. Mm -hmm. It has set my path. It has introduced me to some amazing people, magicians, uh, philosophers, uh, mystics, and yeah, it's, it's been it's been a life thing. I'm a lifer. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, and for me, I'm not a native to Chicago. Uh, however, I uh, met Lavelle and the other people associated with the occult group in Chicago, like maybe two weeks after moving here uh, in, the, uh, in the early 90s, and uh, was lucky enough to uh, find like-minded people, uh, fall into like a kismet type of situation, uh, where we were dedicated to the magical and mystical arts and training, and at that point I was really young and just looking to um, like learn as much as possible and uh, it's been many many years now and actually about 13 almost 14 years ago now uh, when it came time for the previous owner of the occult bookstore to retire uh, uh, Lavelle was given a call and it was basically an opportunity that we, we couldn't pass up uh, a chance to be able to uh, turn something that we had been dedicated to already for decades as individuals and then even as a small group uh, into something like a life passion into like a life work and then integrate that with like um, like with our day jobs right it right. became our day job and it was just a dream come true and integrated in, into um, the work we were already doing in the community mm -hmm. I mean I was involved with a number of, of groups she was involved with mm -hmm. groups as well and, and we were all in the community doing our thing right so this gave us a platform and a um a voice to that and that was right a blessing right and a forum to be able to continue to do that you actually the place where i met laval was uh at your wednesday night like open houses, which, oh, that's right. which continue, do. which continue to happen through a cult, uh, uh, for many years through a cult bookstore and then through a cult society. But back, back then it was Java Crucians right. through, uh, through right. Omaha. Through Omaha. Yes. Which is the, uh, the encampment the, for, or the, uh, yeah, the, the, body, OTO the body, body for the OTO for Chicago. Had, right? That I chartered initially. And, um, yeah, that was that was. Yeah. Yeah. So Long it's always. Magical career. Yeah, it has been. Yeah. <laughs> so the Long road. so the occult bookstore now the occult society and I'll get into a little bit about how it became the occult society, but the occult bookstore has always been kind of this gathering spot. That you've you've talked about you've seen this whole thing especially in in your in your your current life. Uh -huh. yeah, it's always been this kind of grounding spot for um, like a lot of different groups. So people. This isn't a, so. Let's make this very clear. This is an occult store versus a pagan Wiccan store or oh, something. Right. Can you yeah. describe a little bit of difference of what 
a difference of a, of a true, like a cult store, uh, the, the kind of things we do versus, you know, just more the more modern Peg and Wiccan store. I, I've always said that, that a cult applies to what is hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, so those mysteries, those uh, traditions, those religions and practices that that you don't want to talk about even christianity has those that you don't right. want to talk about you don't you don't talk about jesus the magician even though we all know jesus was a magician right or the nazarene you know? <laughs> right. right the teachings of the cult of the nazarene even yes right so so as a, a bookstore and what the bookstore has always done has been to provide this kind of resource driven mm -hmm. personal driven like everybody that worked at the store were magicians were um, pagans were mystics so they all had their traditions and they all brought it into this kind of cohesive group that could then provide those services and those understandings mm -hmm. and and a more eclectic look at the whole picture that is occult, magic, mysticism, all of those things. Right, right. What it does when you have when you have a meeting of practitioners like this, especially those who are willing to come together in a space that is neutral, it right. becomes it becomes a nexus of its own. It becomes like it takes on a life force. And to be honest, I we're talking about the origins of the occult bookstore that goes back to the original mission of mm -hmm. why the original owner dj nelson uh opened these doors to begin with like decades and decades ago uh, in downtown chicago it was to be a resource for the community mm -hmm. anyone who was a practitioner or a seeker or right. somebody who like valued the essence of esoteric knowledge the mm -hmm. occult the hidden the things that are especially in North America considered taboo. This was a place to come, put all that aside, walk into the doors and have like a non-denominational approach we, of like like all cultures and world religions. We, we've had so many people, not so many, we've had a few people who have come in and, and been like, you should change the name. Mm. And however well-meaning they were, we never wanted to change the name because for us, the name it embodied what we were doing. We weren't, we weren't a particular sliver. We weren't a slice. We weren't, we weren't catering to the pagans or the people who do meditation and yoga or this. We were all of it all the mistake right and to and to change the name then also gives like more energy to it being a taboo and right. staying hidden right. in mm -hmm. the first place and part of the whole drive uh, especially like under our uh under our care as caretakers here of the occult bookstore and now like like the occult society is to bring light to these things and not to have it be... Um, and to be an open resource. Yes. To be an open resource for people. It, you said neutral ground, and it mm -hmm. really is neutral ground. Mm -hmm. It is, we, we're like, n no no tradition is better than another tradition. It's like, well, the tribal traditions, they're, they're all low over here, and we've got high magic over here, and we've got all this all these terms that imply right. some... The, the Wiccans imbalance. don't like the witches. Or, right. you know, And the truth is, is that we're all just practitioners on our path, like taking the next step, wherever you are. Like, it's all about like, okay, what's the next step? What's your next step? I can't tell you what that is, but I can talk to you about where I'm at, you know, and like what's worked for me, uh, also what hasn't worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> so my second tarot deck was bought from the occult bookstore. Uh -huh. oh, wow. <laughs> the first one was my mom's. The second one nice. I did is I was, I, was, I was 15 years old and I came into the occult bookstore when it was on State Street at the time. Oh my gosh. Right down from Frenchie's. Yes. Um, and I bought my first tarot cards and really started uh, learning about it at that place. I would meet somebody like Donna Cole Schultz, who's Donna Cole, yeah. nice. and that's where I would meet a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I think that was very important to that early day for me is that 
Llewellyn had not come in. This was really one of the very few sources. Llewellyn hadn't really come in. This is right. You know, to date you myself, had the Lawrence, but that was about. Huh? You had the Lawrence, but that was about it. Right. And it was 78, 1978. Right. I actually mm -hmm. looked it up today. Wow. Um, so in that moment, in that, in that set of energy of being coming into it, um, I would buy occasional books and do, spend a lot of time on the floor, um, and that sort of thing. So it was very open for me to come in there, but for me, it was one of the only sources. The library didn't have very much. Mm -hmm. It was not there. Mm -hmm. Today, I find now precious. So let me, now you've been caretaking it. Not only have you been involved for a long time, but you've been caretaking for 14 years, as you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, going on 14, yeah. And of course, you've been seeing it. So now you've really come in an age where the internet has kind of chewed up some of the ground in there. So there isn't, mm -hmm. the kid that's like me, or like yourself, I believe, mm -hmm. are not so much going into being, you know, going into the occult bookstore to find the books. Right. Or, or am I wrong on that? We're, no, they're, you're not. They're, okay. they're not really, they, there is less of this, it, it is less an oasis. Like when I first found the bookstore, I, it was something, it was like something out of Harry Potter. I, I had walked this street, it was, when I had found it, it was on Clark and Belmont. Although, this, this is a cute little uh, tie, I lived at 300, uh, State Street on, at Marina City. That's where I was raised from 10 to like my teen years. And I used to go by the store, but I didn't know, I, I, I was, it was always that spooky store, that, that spooky satanic store. So I never went in. I didn't go in until it was on Clark and Belmont. And then I had walked by this place hundreds of times and I looked up and it was like, doo -doo 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 -doo. this is an occult, what? So, so I, I've taught martial arts for years, and one of the things that I, I've come to understand is that you really, that there is, that there is something that you cannot learn in magic or in spiritual practice or or like any training in martial arts, in, in, in boxing and punching, you need somebody who's walked the road to kind of help fine tune yes. your path on that road. Um, and and it, even if it's just a second set of eyes, it, what we get off the internet is, is, is at, at the very best, it is it is deep and full. At the very worst, it's surface and eh. But if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts, you've got to put your hands on it. You've got to you got to have somebody who's walked it to to make sure the little bits are in the right place. And I, I don't know how to word that any better. But mm -hmm. that was very very well phrased. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. In, in that aspect of it, so what is what is the occult society going to do going forward of it? Yes. Well, I mean, we we've really been in a blessed position mm -hmm. for for many years now. Um, uh, for you, decades, you know, for me, like going on that. Uh, and what's so amazing about the a cult here in Chicago. Uh, again, is that it behaves like this nexus and it sort of brings in on a life of its own uh, the uh, different, different variables that are needed in order to build a rich experience. So we have people, you know, worldwide who come through um, and uh, know our reputation and are very, very like high trained experts in their fields, whatever it happens to be, like alchemy or uh, you know a specific form of Shintoism, uh, like these uh, uh, it's just high level occult, occult folk, people who have yeah. dedicated uh, their lives and a large portion of their hearts and their energies towards keeping what is hidden alive right. and because of that uh, we realize that in this age of the internet where there's like so much a flux of information that it was really important for us 
to concentrate on keeping that lexicon and that community really, really strong and thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, for us to be able to have uh, the time to be able to pull back a little bit from being like a, uh, a ma and pa shop that was like, you know, right. for profit and move more into like a religious organization and mm -hmm. like to a church actually. We've been, uh, been incorporated as a non-for-profit as a church uh, with that mind to sort of like explore like, like all of these variables of the human condition and mm -hmm. the human experience in relation to magic and mysticism and spirituality. Um, all the fingers of spirit, all the the avenues of religion we are I, I don't i don't think lisa or myself ever get tired of of exploring mm -hmm. new avenues mm -hmm. and new traditions that doesn't mean we disrespect our old traditions i haven't disrespected any of my traditions mm -hmm. from my from my tribal ancestry and traditions all the way into my high magic there, there, there is no truth in the in the statement that you can't be a, a, a votisant and a high magician at the same time. Sure, you can. You can be a pagan and a wizard. You can be a, a, a Buddhist and a, a, a fakir. You can be a Sufist and mm -hmm. a, a tribal African, whatever. You, you, you can. All of these things can be in the same pot. And they're all just expressions of the way spirit touches man. So, so we definitely embrace that in in the, in, in our church format because there really is right. no format from the state side that says, "Well, how do you do this?" So it becomes a church. But we are definitely a church that deals with tribal, indigenous. Yeah. Uh, Cold hidden world mysteries, yeah. occult mysteries mm -hmm. and brings it into a, 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 a format where you can work with it you can meet people in that in those communities mm -hmm. or in those traditions and you can run right and continue to be the resource right. like the thing that has given I'm positive the thing that has given a cult a cult bookstore and now a cult society its longevity mm -hmm. is from the very beginning the mission like to be as a magical resource so yes that shifted from like being now a non-profit you know here like in 2020 uh but the mission remains the same and maybe even more so the, the mission's really kind of expanded the truth is whereas in the store format mm -hmm. we were kind of tied up in this kind of very small box right where we had to be salesmen we had to be this and now we can step back and start looking at publishing and writing and community gardening yes. and uh, community outreach and right. retreats right. and all of this stuff that makes us e even bigger than a center. We are we are we are now. I mean, we have we have garden stuff. We have we have we we have so many things that that are spiritual. That are a cult, that are mistake, right. but that don't fit into the store. It's right. like the store model. Right. That's, of what the, that what has you're doing. this this nexus that has that has existed, you know, like which drew you in, mm -hmm. you know, for right. your first tarot deck, which drew you in as a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, which had me find this space within two weeks as a magical person mm -hmm. who is like dedicated, you know, to like the mm -hmm. mysteries uh, and the nuances of life, uh, it's still a nexus, but it's turned into like a much larger platform. Because mm -hmm. uh, we have a whole this is lexicon. A we have a whole lexicon worldwide, you <laughs> right. know, like like down to South and Central America, you right. know, with the Awas and the Chamans and like again, like like uh, uh, worldwide, you know, experts who uh, it's very humbling, but have come through as like kind of on a like recognizing like type mm -hmm. of of situation where when you have people who are 
for their life's work, doing mm -hmm. the magical and the mystical and the types of things that we are dedicated to here in the occult bookstore. And yes, now the occult society is like, when you meet somebody else like that who is dedicated to this path, you recognize each other almost like non-verbally. Mm -hmm. um, and we just needed to shift into a non-profit mode so that we could take a step back to be able to like organize that all, you know, publish with it. And for me, like I, both of us, but for me particularly, like a passion is like parts of the living earth and the living tradition, you know, and to be able to like work closely with the land, you know, in line with like the, the season cycle. That makes some sense. So as the bookstore got more to be too tight of a box, as that information got commoditized, there was real competition against you guys from online sources and things like that. Mm -hmm. You guys wanted to move into where you, as you were mentioning earlier, where the experiences mm -hmm. uh, become more important. The people who are coming in are looking for these experiences. And now mm -hmm. you're in this new format, which only happens to be a church because the state obligates it to, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. They like their boxes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you're now going out and giving these experiences. Right. Now, one of the things I think that's very interesting with the occult bookstore, if you go back into its history, as you, as you know, if you go back, you guys have had numerous classes over the years. Mm -hmm. And some of the classes that you taught in the early days were, were some of these occultists' first classes they taught. And some of these people have now gone on to be leaders. Really you've had, famous. Yeah, yeah you've had uh, Lon Duquette. Yes. He's dealt, brought out Ceremonial Magic. You've had Oberon Zell. Yes. You, um, Don Luce has done his class. You know, our own yes. Elka, Absolutely. Phaedra. Absolutely. You know, a lot of these people, but they were very young oftentimes when they were doing these classes. Uh -huh. So you guys have been kind of that entry point. Do you still see yourselves as that entry point for a lot of these of the next generation of leadership? Yes. Very much so. Um, very we, much so. We, we uh, even, even to the point of local artists, every time a local artist, a local practitioner, a local person comes in with a, a, a new slant, or a novel, or, or just that passion. I won't even say it has to be something new, but they have that passion that attracts people to it. We wanna be a resource that can get them involved. Mm -hmm. And we wanna have the ability to not be limited by the fact that we're just a store. No, we're not just a store. Right. We are now a society of people who right. are all united at least in a, in, in a loose communal format that mm -hmm. can provide ground right. for you to, right. a platform to grow your tree. And a forum, um, especially for, I mean, uh, people who are particularly gifted, people yes. who have uh, done a, followed a specific theurgic path, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then developed their own uh, grimoire like mysteries off of it like mm -hmm. these types of things to be able to have the classes and the book launches and the special events mm -hmm. highlighting these people all which we take very seriously in terms of like vetting the quality uh uh, and the value of those mysteries being put out you know and again like with the mind of like uh, being almost like a conservation society on that mm -hmm. point, you know, like like at this point we really have kind of like two uh, two main directions that we're going. It is it it is limitless, um, but Laval is so much of a bibliophile like, that's never going to be something that yes. like uh, I, I move back and forth from the Midwest to the West Coast, <laughs> Midwest and back and forth, at each of those times. I had a truck with full of books. Yes. It wasn't full of anything else. Yes. I didn't have any furniture. I didn't have books. So I'm, I'm really a bibliophile. Yes. It is, it is <laughs> I like my you, books. It is with you for life. Um, <laughs> and so for Laval to be uh, more on the direction of uh, rare publishing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, putting together uh, different grimoires, gathering that rare information, uh, right. mm -hmm. even like... Uh, and, and being exposed to that rare information. Yes. Like, like I, 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 I have been lucky enough to find, to have in my hands so many of the rare yeah. texts that you can't get anymore. Yes. So I'm like, how can we get this back so that people can actually see it? How can right. we get 
stuff that's not on the internet yet. <laughs> right, right. But but I mean, not yes. even on the internet because I, I think somehow, so, sometimes the internet ends up being a place where you take without giving, mm -hmm. you take without caring, mm -hmm. and, and you end it's up cutting it up. Yeah, yes. you, you, you lose some of that. Right. But we really want to, or at least I really want the, the, a library of Alexandra mm -hmm. or something like that. Something where people go to gain wisdom. Right, absolutely. So there's that main, uh, uh, main avenue. Um, and then also for both of us, mm -hmm. um, the community at large and the social support that is so needed for people who are yes. already on the fringe. You know, I mean, pagan, Wiccan, uh, people who are into like alternative forms of spirituality mm -hmm. are naturally on the fringe of community. And it is so vital to be able to have like the social resource and for us to be able to come together and like know each other and learn thereby and break bread with each other. And like, and this is something that's, that's, that's almost, it's, it's epigenetic. It's something that's going mm -hmm. back through human history, the celebrations of the equinoxes and the solstices and the other like, like Sabbaths throughout the year. Um, we want to be at a place where as a society, uh, we are bringing these occult events to the community in like a larger and larger fashion. And like to the place where eight times of year we have like a repertoire, you know, of mysteries which are presented in which as a community, if you want to take part in, you know, and even have like an active role in, please do and come, so. The, the alternative community, whether trans, mm -hmm. whether various minorities, right. whether homosexual, straight, all of them, once you go into that alternative community, right. you are on the edge. Yes. Being on that edge, gives you a lot of spiritual stuff that you have to deal with yeah. that that comes across your radar that 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 affects you in ways that it doesn't affect people who in the center, into the center of society. who are normal who can go um, so right. but you know yes. what i'm saying yes so so for for us we we are we are working towards being a resource for all of we welcome all of that. Right. This and is being a very wide, neutral. A wide platform. So then with the uh, with the Library of Alexandra uh, type of resource, but then also with like, you know, the genuine warmness of what you would find like uh, you know, at a, a community a mm -hmm. community gathering. Right. So um, two more questions and I think you get Grace great. Um, one of the things that we're starting to see emerge, and you've, you hit on it about the idea of experience and knowledge and rare knowledge. Yeah. Now, the truth is very little actual information. At one level, it seems like an overwhelming amount of information. Right. But the truth is, it's really not very much information on the internet. As you tell, there's a lot of the ancient tomes, the cult bookstore has passed a lot of rare books through it. Mm -hmm. um, you guys probably hold on to a lot of probably out of print, out of order, out of uh, sort of these sort of books. Mm -hmm. Um, that you're giving access to. Mm -hmm. So as this idea of us, we get more experiential, do you feel yourselves being like a mystery school more? Or do you yes. feel? Yes, we are, we are, I mean, the truth is the occult bookstore has always had its mystery school in the background. Absolutely. Right. The question has, has, has been, how, how much of that do you want to present? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much of that do you put on the front? And in, in the current state of our society, a lot more of the depth needs to come to the front because of the internet and all of that stuff, which is all a lot of glossed over right. stuff, or not glossed over, but surface stuff. And, and you, you, you need the real meat. And truth be told, like also in context as to where we are in terms of human history, you know, you have, uh, you know, tribes in the Amazon uh, and other like, you know, native indigenous peoples 
who those those traditions are being lost mm -hmm. and we are you know uh we are not <laughs> in a comfortable position you know with this planet which sustains us and you know i mean the earth itself will certainly survive but us as humans have like lost the some of our culture is, is threatened yes we've and, we've, and we've, we're coming we've, more and more we've, we've lost the point right. mm -hmm. in a lot of ways and so you have all this information out on the internet, but yet like like the true wisdom and that type of knowledge like is is still like not being like like expressed out. And so um so yeah, we're really driven to be a forum for that. And it's so important not just with the internet, but then also like uh with uh tribal knowledge and indigenous knowledge and uh, like like all of these ethnic traditions which uh not just come through from book knowledge mm -hmm. but come through like with like that experience that mouth to ear type yes. of learning that takes places only like like under these true apprenticeships to be able to like be at least a a platform for those things which it seems like in this modern age we are desperately uh, dangerously close to losing and, and this and I, and I want to also stress this is just a side point that we we are not talking about not embracing technology oh, no. or the internet or anything like that we definitely embrace those media too because that's all about voice and having your voice in the right places. However, there is a deeper, more I, this is this is closing <laughs> a deeper, more um, uh, 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 functional, spiritual, magical work that needs to be accomplished as well as mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The voices through many ears and many many media. Yes. Many forms. Yes, and those and those who have those mysteries who are willing to share them and to write them down mm -hmm. um, or to um, have them live on uh, through human culture, like that's what we're dedicated to preserving. And yeah. Okay. So, how do people get involved with you? How do you want, how can we help you as a community? How can the community help you grow? All right. Um, or survive. I'm going to let her yes. feel that one. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, well, for, uh, for general involvement, like, again, since like the early 90s, uh, a cult in one version or another has been doing a Wednesday night, like open, mm -hmm. open Socratic discussion. So every Wednesday we come together we open our doors and we allow the community to come regardless of your level of experience or whatever path you're coming from to come check your ego at the door and have a round table discussion in which we are learning from each other mm -hmm. so that is the first thing like first in terms of getting involved by like sort of like helping yourself right, that is the handshake right um, but also like we are more and more, uh, doing community events, uh, this year Beltane is going to be our third annual one that a cult has done, uh, for the community at large. And we're looking more towards, uh, having those more fleshed out to the place, uh, where I'd love to be doing like eight times a year, uh, a, a community celebration which of course is us coming together and we need uh, support in terms of making those happen um, not just physically but also like you know monetarily um, a cult society is still a combination of marketplace like sacred marketplace temple and teaching facility so um, and what's lovely now is that now that we're nonprofit and we are going for our uh, 501 uh, status, 
uh, is that donations and volunteers and stuff like that are going to be well within the line of uh, right. what our, our model is accepting here. Mm -hmm.